I also wanted to mention that I got nervous when I got up here at the beginning and didn't say that this is uh, funded by both FAST and also FAST Australia. So also to our live feed people out there, um, thank you so much. And now we'll have Professor Jorge Pedrojita and he's going to talk to you more about how we're going to do this. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a, it's a unique opportunity for me. I've been in, in the science business for a very long time, and this is the first project where I had such close contact with the people that we eventually hope to, to impact. So it's a, a very special day for me. So I'm going to tell you who I am and why, why I'm involved in this project, and hopefully convince you that, that we have the expertise and the capabilities to, to, to help with this particular project. I'm a professor of molecular biomedical sciences at NC State. I'm also the director of a center, the Center of Comparative Medicine and Translational Research. So it's, uh, the, the mission of this center is precisely to do the kind of work that we're involved in FAST, which is to translate basic discoveries to the uh, hospital very quickly. And so I wear two hats, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about those two hats because it's important for this particular project. So the center is a, is a fairly large uh, unit. It's a virtual center, and it's a virtual center on purpose because we're looking for a high degree of interdisciplinary uh, components, and you cannot find those in a single place. So we look for them all over the place. So we have, we have fa faculty uh, in located in engineering, in textiles, all throughout the university. So a, a very brief snapshot of who we are. We are highly interdisciplinary. We have both animal uh, doctors and human doctors. We have engineering, textiles, bioinformatics, basic scientists. Again, we, put, we assemble a team of highly uh, qualified individuals to solve a particular uh, question. We are, ha have 172 faculty members involved, multiple departments, and multiple universities. We don't have a medical school at NC State, so we have uh, uh, MDs from Duke, MDs from UNC, and uh, from Wake Forest that are part of our, of our center to help us go from the basic concept to the animal uh, model to the human clinics. Again, we have a very good balance of clinical and basic research, and, and this is our mission. This is what we do. So we do comparative medicine and translational research, which is precisely what Scott was talking about uh, earlier, which is the, the mouse model to the pig model to the human model. That is comparative medicine, and again, that movement to eventually get it to a therapy, that's translational medicine. So that's one of the hats that, that, uh, that I wear. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about one of the units in here, the hospital, because the animal hospital that we have at state is considered right now the most modern uh, veterinary hospital in the world. It was finished two years ago, cost more than $70 million, and basically the animals that we house in there get essentially the same treatment that you will get in a, in a human hospital. And so when we bring people over here that are surprised, but for us, it's important to give you the, the message that these animals that we're gonna generate are gonna be cared in the absolute best facilities available. They, they will have the absolute best clinicians and the best housing environment and the best uh, uh, treatment that they can get. So we are cognizant that we are making animals that are gonna have a syndrome that's very difficult to deal with, but we also have unbelievable facilities so that those animals are carrying the absolute best way possible. So that's one of my hats. My other hat is I'm an investigator. I've been an investigator for a very long time. Uh, this is my 26th year in this business and I love every minute of it. So what are my credentials kind of stuff? You know, how can you trust me? So. My research program has raised over $12 million uh, over the years in extramural funding. It's been a steady program. I have been funded by the National Institute of Health since 1993 for us scientists working in this particular er er uh, field. That's kind of a batch of honor. Getting an NIH grant is a big deal. Getting an, an NIH grant time after time after time, it's a, it's a pretty big deal. So it's a batch of honor for us. And then this is the other batch of honors. When, when then the NIH asks you to review the grants and make decisions on funding. And I've been doing that since 1984. I go to anywhere between three and four study sections every year. I'm still doing it. I'm still being invited. So that tells you a little bit about my credibility as a scientist at the NIH level, at the biomedical scientist level. Uh, for my own research, I'm, I'm recognized as an expert in large animal transgenics. That's why I'm involved in this particular project. I, I've been making transgenic pigs for quite a while. I'm working with stem cells and somatic cell nuclear transfer. 
I travel throughout the world to give invited presentations uh, and, and I get to basically ask to, to uh, write reviews in this particular field to maintain the, the readers updated to all the amazing changes that are happening. So I bring uh, with me a certain amount of scientific credibility is what I'm trying to tell you. But why am I here? Because of this particular work. So we've been working in somatic cell nuclear transfer and we've been working with transgenic pigs for a long time. I published extensively in this area. I'm not just, I'm just basically some of the papers. I also work in mice. And I'm gonna take you to the actual project. So here's what we're trying to do. Or actually, this, here's what we're going to do. And to make a transgenic AS, uh, an ASP, it's really two fairly straightforward uh, uh, steps. Um, in one, sorry, I don't have, a, let's see if I can get, no, I can't. Um, can you see my arrow? Oh yeah, okay, great. So this is the first component. We need to make a cell from a pig that contains the UB3A mutation. So that's step number one. We, take, we need to take a normal cell and convert that normal, normal cell into an AS cell. So that's done in culture, that's done in, the, in, in vitro, in incubators, and that's, uh, I'll tell you in a second how that part is done. But a cell is a cell, it's not an organism. I need a live organism to be able to study the syndrome. So then we use the cell comp component, which we call somatic cell nuclear transfer, in, in the public is called cloning. So we take that, that cell and we clone that cell and we then generate our pigs. So that's exactly what we're gonna do. We're gonna create an AS cell, then we're gonna take that cell and we're gonna create a pig with that particular defect. I'm not gonna talk to you a lot, a lot about these guys, but these guys are unbelievable. They, they've been around for about two years. We call them as a family meganucleases. And basically the purpose of these uh, uh, compounds is to allow us to make those changes in the cells at very, very, very high efficiencies. So with these guys, I can make that AS mutation in a matter of two months. Before, it would have taken us two years. So we use these guys. So how do we actually make this particular model? So we take cells from the pig, we dissociate those cells, we combine them with these uh, chemicals that I just told you about. The chemicals are designed to attack only the UB3A, they go into the cell, they modify the UB3A gene. We then select the cells that have the modification that we're interested in. And once we've identified those cells, we use those cells for the cloning step. I mean, it really is that simple. Design the chemical to attack UB3A, introduce that chemical in the cells, find the cells that, correct, that have the mutation, and once the cells are identified, we use them for cloning. And the cloning step is technically very, very challenging, and there's very few labs in the world that can do it. But conceptually, it's actually quite, quite simple. So you have two units here. You have the egg, what we call the oocyte, that has a lot of really unbelievable material inside, but it has the maternal DNA, which we don't want. And then we have the donors, which in this case are gonna be the Angelman syndrome cells that have the nuclear DNA with the mutation that we want to recreate. And we just to put those two together. The first step we do is we take the DNA from the mom so that there's no DNA in the cell at all, but all of the goodies in that egg are still in there. Then we bring the cell with the mutation, we combine those two, we put them physically close to each other, and I'll show you in a movie in a second. And then we fuse them electrically, we just give them an electrical pulse that causes the membranes to fuse, the DNA is now into that egg, and we give them a little chemical activation to mimic what the sperm would do. And all of a sudden, the egg starts to divide, and there you have a transgenic embryo. It's now a clone, but it's now a clone with an AS mutation. This is uh, how we actually do the procedure. It's, uh, again, it takes a, a lot of expertise, but so we have this, the eggs are stained to be able to look so the DNA is blue, and you can see that the DNA has been removed. It doesn't take a lot of the other stuff out. This is another one, I'm just showing two of them. So you can see the skills that are required to do this. There's the DNA in blue. She comes in with the pipette, removes a little bit of the cytoplasm and the DNA. You just see it going into the pipette, and then these are the cells that are gonna replace it. This would be the AS cells. In essence, each of those cells can be a pig. So you load them in the pipette, you put them back into the oocyte. So now you've reconstituted the oocyte, you do the fusion, you do the activation, you've recreated the unit, but now with the mutation, the AS mutation inside. So have we been able to do this? We have generated over 500 clones in, in uh, between, uh, I started at Texas a and between Texas a and and CSU. These are the projects that we have ongoing in the lab right now. We are funded by the NIH to do tracking lines that can be used to follow cells after transplantation. I'm just gonna give you one slide of each of those projects in a second. This one, we work very intensely in transplantation and regenerative medicine. And so most of our projects are related to that. 
We also developed an animal model of dwarfism, a pig model of dwarfism. We have an ongoing project to tag intestinal stem cells uh, with fluorescent markers in, in the pig to be able to look at what happens after injury and repair. And our most complex project to date, which we've been funded for 16 years by the NIH for this particular project, is to create what's called a sinoimmune pig to be able to host human stem cells, and that way you can test human cells in an actual pig model. Um, this is the pig that we made. The GFP pigs have been made before. Ours is a little different than, than the conventional ones. The, our marker is in the nucleus, and the reason that we want it in the nucleus is because it allows us to look at cell division. So if you can look at some of the photographs, you can see the embryo is being divided, and you can actually follow the chromosome segregating. So it allows us to look at very um, basic aspects of chromosome segregation. So it's, it's a green component, but it's only in the nucleus. So when we inject this uh, cell into a non-transgenic animal, it's very easy to find in the microscope because all we need to do is scan and look for a little green dot. And then that's the nucleus from our green cells. So we know what our cells are doing, and that's very important in these transplantation studies. This is the dwarf, dwarf pig. These guys uh, have been around for a while, and they are about 25% the size of the normal one. So these guys are litter mates. They're born at the same time. One of them has a mutation, the other one does not. And you can see it's a perfectly healthy little guy. He's just a, a, a dwarf. So now we have a way of studying this, the, the influence of this particular gene. Dwarfism has a lot of genes of the influence of this particular gene, which is a very interesting gene in dwarfism. But again, trying to show you that we have done this in the past and we can do it. This is by far the most complex project that we've tackled, which is that we need to modify not one gene, but two genes. And we need to modify two genes by disrupting all copies of the gene. So in other words, maternal copy and paternal copy of both genes. So we need to do four modifications. This had been done in mice, and so these mice have been around for about 10 years. They're incredibly invaluable in research. They're used for pharmacology, they're used for vaccine development, they're used for viral studies. They've been a gold mine in terms of, of, of biomedical research because you can, trans, uh, you can put into a mouse the human immune system. So you have a little mouse with the human immune system in it. So we, we wanted to do uh, the, the, the pig counterpart because of the issues that, that talk, uh, Scott, uh, Scott mentioned of uh, the mouse not being always a good model. So we went ahead on, on this one, and I'm just going to describe very briefly from the technical perspective what we did. So in the AS system, we were going to have to do one of these rounds. In this case, we had to do two rounds. So we, we, we prepare our chemicals to, to inactivate this particular gene, the L2 receptor gamma. We did the cells. We found the ones with the mutation. We cloned that guy, but then we took cell lines from that guy, and we did a second round of mutations, and then we mutated the second gene. So we, we didn't breed this animal, so it saves us about two years. We literally took the little piglet, took cells from that piglet, and we immediately produced a second generation. So it saves a tremendous amount of money by being able to do this cloning and recloning. So we were able to do this, uh, this guy, and we generated over 100 of these guys already. They have the phenotype that we expected. This is a normal pig. I'm not going to show you a lot of data. That second mountain is basically the immune cells of, of a normal pig. And this is our mutant. It completely lacks immune cells. So they're obviously, they're very difficult to keep. But that's not why we need them. We need them is because we want them with human cells. So we've been able to engraft them with human hematopoietic stem cells. This is the first time that this has ever been done. We have not published this. So this is, you guys are some of the first ones that are actually seeing this data. So this is the first peak with human immune cells that is, uh, is out there. And you can see the mountain over there when we go in and look at them in by, by immunohistochemistry, basically by, by an, ant an antibody that detects human cells. The first two panel, the first panel is a controls. The second panel is a method of transplantation that we used that didn't work. And then the third panel is the method of transplantation that did work. And you can see that both the thymus and the spleen was chock full of human Im immune cells. So we've been able to accomplish a very, very, very complex project. So can we do it? You cannot predict science. Science is unpredictable. But I think we have the skills and we have the, the resources and the experience to be able to do this particular project. And, and I'll be more than happy to answer any questions. Uh, again, um, I'm very excited about this particular project because I've never been this close to, to the patient, you know, to somebody that's actually affected with, the, with the, the disease. So for myself and for the people in my life, this is going to be a very unique project, and I'm really excited about it. 
And obviously you don't do this work without support and you don't do this work without amazing people in your lab. So FAST has uh, funded this project. We're waiting for the funds right now, but I uh, hope to start soon. And then my lab is a small group, but it's an amazing group of individuals. Thank you very much. Okay, so we need Scott to come back up. And we're gonna take questions for the audience. So Sharon Wall Chalker from FAST is gonna be walking on this side of the room. Just raise your hand and we'll bring you the microphone and I'll come down through this side of the room. Um, these are your scientists, so feel free to ask any question that you have about what they've talked about today. Uh, anything you want clarification for, this is the place where we want you to understand what it is that we're doing as an organization and what you're doing by supporting this. Can you hear me? Scott, just going back to your presentation, can you just explain a little bit more or define what you mean by throughput? You know how you had all the models from fly to rotor to pigs and you had some numbers there, one to two? Can you just define what that actually means, the starting point and the ending point? Uh, yeah. And um, uh, so, so in a system like that, I think what the idea behind that is, um, and, and there's probably some others in the room that could comment on this, but, but Testing, let's say, one drug in a mouse um, can take uh, a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of resources. And so sort of starting with the mouse and working back and forward, um, you know, if you have one particular drug or a, a therapeutic that you're interested in, there's significant investment to test that, like say in your typical animal model, and let's just say a mouse. Um, using the fly as a model, uh, it enables us to uh, look at potentially hundreds, if not thousands, of drugs or candidates um, because of the life cycle, because of their cost, and so forth. And so there are limitations to it. I mean, they, you know, we're, we're, we're getting further away from a human, but it does allow us to, to look at things more carefully and to look at a lot of things. And so this has actually been done. Uh, there have uh, been studies uh, in Fragile X, for example, where uh, uh, drug candidates were screened on the Fragile X flies and there were actually uh, drugs identified that were then moved forward into testing in a mouse model. Uh, going back from that in the cell culture model, um, some of y'all are probably familiar with uh, some of the studies that have already been done, but you know, we can screen through tens of thousands of potential drugs or, or therapeutics. And so the system is set up in such a way where, and, and it can be manipulated and it can be done very differently, but the idea is to maximize your chances of finding something. And so, for example, we'll talk about this later on in the day, we're focusing primarily on FDA-approved drugs. And so the system works to where uh, you start with the, the, the high throughput, sort of the cell culture model, where you can look at thousands of, of candidates. You can do that very quickly. It's, um, it, you know, it's, I wouldn't say it's inexpensive, but it's not nearly as expensive as, let's say, a, a mouse or a pig. And then you can use that to sort of filter out things. Um, in addition to that, uh, one of the ways that we're doing is those are very target-based approaches. So, for example, we're looking at things that will only affect the expression of, of UB3A. In the FLY model, uh, you can imagine where uh, potential candidates are, are discovered in a cell culture-based system, um, and so they're tested again in flies just to get another look at them to see if they have the same effect or whatnot. But in the fly system, what it allows you to do is not target the gene itself, but just to target the symptoms that are associated with the condition. So as, as I'd mentioned, the models that have been generated, you know, in the, many of the phenotypes are common and they're shared. And so the fly actually, you know, it has issues when we, you know, delete the UB3A gene. And so we don't necessarily have to, to change the expression of that gene or, or really anything that's, that's targeted towards that gene, we can see if just anything works. But again, it's a way for us to look at a lot of targets. If you move to the other side, let's say towards the pig, that's where things are refined. Um, you know, where they've been tested in multiple different systems and they've passed each test along the way and you want one more look at it before it jumps into a clinical setting. And, and people have done this historically with pigs, but we've never been able to generate them with the conditions that the drugs have been developed to treat. They've always been a, a last stage or final stage model to test things like to toxicity, um, dosage, and whatnot. But because we can make the model, 
we can do all that, but we can also test the efficacy of the drug to see if it actually ameliorates any of the symptoms that are associated with it. So that's sort of the idea. I mean, I think that's what we're trying to put together as a system that, that allows us to look at a lot of potential therapeutics, to screen as many as we can, and then at the end of the process to be very confident in what we found prior to moving into a clinical setting. Um, that, that jump is very big going from a mouse uh, to a human. And there, the, there are lots of failure stories, you know, because of that. I have a quick question for Dr. Pedrahita while we're walking around here. Um, you were mentioning that the mice without an immune system, or I mean the pigs without an immune system are very difficult to raise, which one would imagine. Um, do you anticipate that there are going to be issues trying to raise a pig that has Angelman syndrome? We assume that there might be seizures and feeding difficulties and... Yeah, more than likely. I mean, we, at this point, we cannot predict the actual uh, phenotype of the pig. We can only go with what happens in the human and what's happening in the mice and predict some of those difficulties. And that's why the team of, uh, of neurologists has been assembled to make sure that whatever difficulties encountered, we have an individual that's an expert to solve those particular problems. Um, I have a question. So when you have the AS pig and you give whatever chemical compound, I'm right here, I'm over here, um, the chemical compound, whatever it may be, are there specific things you're looking to alleviate? We know AS is so involved with so many different things. Are you looking particularly at seizures, memory, or is it an overall approach? And how will you know if that's successful or not if one thing kind of falls off the wayside? No, and that's a great question. And I, I think, so the, the, the plan, the approach is that, um, you know, the characterization of the model will give us an idea as to what types of, of phenotypes, what types of symptoms that we actually see. We expect uh, because of the physiology, because the pigs will, will not be inbred animals like the mouse models that we use, we do expect the phenotype to be more severe um, you know, in the pig model. But again, we, we, you have to do that. We have to do those experiments to, to determine that. But once we know what they are and, and how similar they are to the human condition, um, then we will look at as, as much as we can in order to test the uh, uh, efficacy of a particular therapeutic. And so you might expect that, that depending on the, the, the symptoms that the animal, the model shows, and the specific therapeutic that's being tested, that um, you could have a number of outcomes. Um, but the idea is to, you know, and this is, this is typical for most model systems, they're generated, they're very well characterized, and then once they're characterized, you have a benchmark that you can use against. What you're doing is incredibly exciting and will affect every person in this room and everybody who has an angel in their lives. My question is this, in the best possible case scenario, what would you, ex how would you expect this to affect one of our angels? Would it involve speech or walking or whatever? And do you see a difference in the outcome for an angel with deletion or, and or mutation? Which, how would that be different? Um, so, I think that the, when, I'll go back, you know, sort of the, the story behind why we, we did this and why we proposed to do this. Um, I, I briefly mentioned, and I'll, and I'll wander a lot to get to your question, but I briefly mentioned uh, the failures that, uh, you know, the pharmaceutical industry has seen taking, uh, you know, potential therapeutics that were identified in mouse models and then moving them into uh, clinical testing. And so um, from my understanding, it, the, the failure rate is roughly 50% or so. There are a lot of therapies that are identified in mouse models that simply just do not work once they go into a clinical setting. And, and much of that stems from just the, the differences between mice and human. You know, even though the, the mutation and the gene or, or what have you may be the same, the, the, the inherent differences in the, the species in terms of the way that they metabolize the drug, the way that it, it works in them, um, in my opinion, I think leads to some of these not working out. And so with that in mind, that was really the idea behind this particular model, a pig model, because um, what it will do is, is um, 
and how it will help is it will increase our confidence that something that we've identified in one of the other systems may actually work. And so it's another you know, uh, leg under the stool that we have to say that, yes, this may actually work once we move it into a clinical setting. And that was really the, the drive behind developing it, was that um, there needed to be another system. You may even argue that there needs to be another one there, uh, such that we, we don't have, a, you know, we, we reduce the number of failures and, and we increase the number of successes. So that I think, in, in my opinion, I think that's where it's going to help the most. It's going to give us another platform to test things before we move them into a clinical setting. With regards to the, to the types of mutation, this particular model um, will be made as a, which would be analogous to a, a point mutation in UV3A. So not the large deletion, not an imprinting defect. Um, this will, the, the pigs will simply have a loss of function of the UV3A gene. So any sort of, uh, of secondary effects that stem from, like say in the large deletion where there are other genes that are missing, um, you know, you may or may not see differences because of that. But this model in terms of the way that we're designing it will simply be a, a, a very targeted knockout of the UV3 gene. Okay, so uh, when I walked in the back, Sean very, uh, very clearly indicated he had a question, so his mom's gonna ask the last question of the session. I just want to remind everybody that's watching on the live feed, if you have questions for the researchers when we do Q&As, please send them through Twitter to uh, about Cure Angelman, and we'll monitor them, and we will um, ask your questions as they come up. And also, all of the researchers are going to be here tonight for an hour to just answer questions. So if you have a burning question you haven't gotten to yet, or you want to think it over and come back tonight, please do so. Okay, Kathy. I turned the volume off. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. It says thank you. <laughs> but um, I just had a, a question because uh, Dr. Dindo, you said something about two years and Dr. P? Yeah, that. Dr. P, that, that's how people call me actually. Yeah. That's exactly how they call you, me. You said something about two months and I'm just. Oh, no, no, no. And, so, and, and, and I, and I want to clarify because I understand those are two different things that you're very, talking very, about. Very, yeah, very different. So no, to, make, uh, to make the modification in the cell. So if I start today with a, with a normal pig cell, I can pretty much uh, with almost 100% certainty tell you that in two months, we're going to have a cell with an Angelman syndrome uh, mutation. But then to take that cell to the living pig and to the analysis of the living pig, that's, that's the additional time. Is that the, the two months is just making the mutation, then making the animal, then analyzing the animal. Those initial analyses are going to be quite difficult because as, you know, we don't know what the phenotype is going to be and how severe. And so that's going to require a lot of analysis before you can even start giving them the drugs. It makes sense. You have to understand what the, what the disease is like before you can start testing the drugs to see if you can improve that disease. Okay, so let's thank the speakers. <laughs> and we have just a few minutes if you want to make a quick run, and then we're going to set up and we're going to start with Angelman syndrome and seizures.